Bodybuilders have long noted that when traveling to competitions using airplanes, when they get in the airplane, they may be in a good condition. What's called good condition is sort of having less extracellular water in certain parts of the body. But not exactly when they leave the airplane, but within a couple of days of leaving the airplane, they tend to hold a film of water across their body, which seems to be indicative of having some kind of inflammation from the air travel. This got me thinking about the subject and I wanted to find out, do, does air travel cause inflammation? And if so, how? In this video, I'm gonna review three detrimental aspects of air travel. Uh, and we're gonna speculate about how those elements can affect chronic inflammation and cause water retention. But before we do, please subscribe to the channel, like the video if you haven't already, and uh, comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now let's get started. In airplane travel, people suffer from hypobaric hypoxia, which means low pressure with low oxygen. Now, while airplanes uh, traditionally cruise at between 7 to 12.5 uh, K meters above sea level, the air cabins where passengers dwell are pressurized to between 1.5 K meters above sea level to 2.5 K meters above sea level. Studies on healthy volunteers have shown that uh, they begin to experience lightheadedness, light uh, fatigue, uh, headaches and other symptoms of the hypobaric environment, most prominently when they reach 2.5 K meters above sea level, and they begin to notice it usually three to nine hours after exposure. In healthy passengers, the, this environment produces a three to 4% reduction in oxyhemoglobin parameters. But in passengers with pre-existing heart, lung, or hematologic disorders, the effect can be much more drastic. For example, a prospective observational study of passengers with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in airplanes found that about 18% of them had at least minor uh, breathing difficulties during the airplane ride. In patients with COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and patients with that disease, acute hypoxia, meaning ac acutely having less oxygen, does increase inflammatory markers in the body and produce systemic inflammation. So this is the first hint that we have to this kind of inflammation that uh, bodybuilders may be experiencing. Before we leave the subject of pressure and oxygen, we have to talk about gases. Our bodies retain gases in them. And according to Boyle's law, the gases volume depends on the pressure of the exterior uh, surrounding area. So as the pressure that we're surrounded by changes in airplanes, um, the gases in our body can expand up to 30%. This can cause some discomfort and the GI system or in the ears, but in people that have had recent surgeries, it can be a little bit more dangerous. For example, in people who have had hernia surgeries. Next, the biggest danger of airplane rides is venous thromboembolism. In fact, uh, riding in an airplane seems to increase the risk of developing venous thromboembolism, which I'll call VTs from now on, uh, by about four times, depending on the study. Uh, there, there are some that say three times or 1.8 times or something like that, but up to four times. The risk increases when flights go past four hours and seems to peak when flights reach eight hours. The risk also seems to increase depending on how much, how immobile the person is. So people that do not sit in aisle seats are more likely to develop venous thromboembolism. A population-based study of 9,000 business travelers found that the risk of VTs increased depending on how many times somebody flied after a first flight within a two-week period. So it's incremental as well and potentially exponential. Dehydration increases the risk of VTs during flights and it seems to be because of the increased viscosity of blood and hemoconcentration. And oral contraceptives for women, because of the effect of estradiol, uh, dramatically increase the risk of venous thromboembolism during flights by up to 14 times. If you're curious about wanting to protect yourself during flights, the evidence for aspirin use is a bit weaker than the evidence for low molecular weight heparin use although long-term effects of using heparin during flights have not been studied that well. So we know that the risk of venous thromboembolism is high. If you are developing venous thromboembolism, your body will also be inflamed. Now moving to the third and final topic, which is of cosmic radiation. This topic is really hard to study. We know that exposure to cosmic radiation increases the risk of cancers, particularly breast cancers and skin cancers. We also know that cabin crew members have dramatically increased risks of uh, incidence of cancers, including skin cancers. However, uh, when trying to, to determine the causality, it's not possible to show that their, ex their airtime exposure or exposure to cosmic radiation is the reason for their increased cancer incidence. It's also not possible to show that the disruption in their circadian rhythms is the reason for it. So it's not very easy to tell. However, we know that 
going in airplanes at a high altitude does increase your cosmic radiation exposure. In pregnant women, the fetus is exposed to the same level of cosmic radiation as the mother. So organizations like the International Commission for Radiological Protection advise mothers to travel less than, I mean pregnant mothers, travel less than 15 trips during their nine months of pregnancy because the 15 trips can add up to uh, their limit for the whole pregnancy of radiation, which is one MSV. Are these three concerns the only ones? No, there are other concerns. So there is a, there's potentially an increased risk of exposure to infectious disease because of the recycled air in the airplane. And there's also the disruption in circadian rhythms that we could account for. But as a whole, I think that we've found enough reasons to, uh, and by the way, it's, it's so fascinating that there's no study on long-term flights showing like a, just a minor increase in C-reactive protein or in tumor necrosis factor alpha. That would have confirmed everything that we needed to know. But uh, not, anyway, nonetheless, it seems there's enough uh, evidence to uh, speculate that the cabin pressures, uh, lack of oxygen, uh, change in volume in, in the gases in our bodies, uh, risk of venous thromboembolism, and the cosmic radiation all may cause some oxidative stress in the body that may be responded to with the immune system and then may lead to some kind of visible water retention. But this is just me speculating. As I said, we don't have real evidence. Anyway, guys, I hope this was helpful. I didn't personally know that much about the dangers of traveling in airplanes except for the radiation element. And that's why I never let myself get scanned, for example, in the airports. I have them search me personally because that scan also has a lot of radiation. Then you go in the airplane, you're at high altitude. But other than that, I didn't. And I, I guess I knew about the venous thromboembolism. But anyways, a helpful review for me and I hope, I hope it was helpful for you guys too. I'll see you next time.